I get very practical with both spirituality and metaphysics. Um, and so today I want to discuss something that's super, super practical, which is meditation. And uh, how many people are experienced meditators? Oh, perfect. Oh, a large group in here. Okay. Um, how are you? What is your name? I'm Valerie. Valerie. Perfect. Valerie, how are me how, do, how do your meditations go? Tell me about it. Well, I did different types of meditations. The movement meditation, the most impressive meditation I did was Vipassana. I did it twice. So the silence retreat for 10 days. Well, you the... How oh, was it? I I mean, are you re meditating regularly on your own? Yeah. And how did your meditation go when you do them on your own? So first, it's like very difficult to you observe your thoughts. But at the beginning, perhaps it's very difficult to to like not like to let it go. It's every day, at least twenty minutes in the morning, oh, I wake up at four o'clock and then I do that. Oh wow! That's yeah. Awesome. Okay, and are you? What happens with your thoughts as you're practicing? Yeah, what happens? I I just think always that it's like the clouds on the sky. They're just coming and go. Nothing happens. Okay, so you just kind of <laughs> watch your thoughts. Yeah. And then what happens after that? Nothing. You just calm. Okay, no, but I mean, in your consciousness, do you get calmer, do you get happier, do you get heavier, do you have emotional release? Yeah, different. It's different. Okay. <laughs> Who else raised their hand? So what is your name? Koalani. Koalani. Yes. Koalani, what is the purpose of meditating? <laughs> My purpose is to get rid of anxiety. Um, and I've had some awesome experiences while doing it. Um, I meditate on average of two hours a day. And what time do you wake up? <laughs> <laughs> it's through the day, so in the morning and then in the evening. Um, when I meditate, sometimes my mind is busy, so I'll put my thoughts on the offering and let it stream down the river. So I have a lot of offerings and then there's no more offerings. You mean mental offerings? Mental, mental offerings Ooh, for my thoughts. And once I reach a state of like empty mind, is what I call it, my body starts buzzing and vibrating and sometimes it's just my hands. Um, but Oftentimes it's my entire body. And sometimes I'm transported or floating or and I've had emotional releases as well. So you doing the business. <laughs> Anyone else? Who else raise their hand experience by the What do you want to comment on meditation? Well, I find like the daily practice that she was saying is the is the, the hardest because personally I do I go to like one hour or two hour meditations weekly and those are you know they can be tough but you get through them but the daily is the toughest and you know it's what what should be the goal I think and as far as the experiences um, I mean meditation is for in my opinion, to to like real yoga, so to to achieve union with the divine. So you go through the processes of breathing and relaxing and relaxing the body, pranayama, controlling, and then through the final finals or like a mantra or something, and then towards the end you you try to to ascend and have you know communion or union with the with the infinite or with divine or God or whatever you want to call it. That's the goal for me. Yeah. Oh, without having it be like the goal. <laughs> you know? yeah. If it happens that you know sometimes you just sit there and you think for an hour. Ah. It is what it is. Um, in terms of daily practice, you know what? I had a breakthrough this morning on my own. Oh, yes. Do you want to open that window behind you? 
That's okay. You know, so first of all, I think everyone can agree if you do mm -hmm. something daily, there's way more benefits. You know what, I was actually even studying this, right? So, um, I used to be a little bit of an athlete. I did a few martial arts, I played high school sports, and I just was always very active. The last few years, I got physically inactive. It was interesting to see how uh, my body got out of shape. And um, and then also, once you get per, uh, far along, enough along any path, positive or negative, you have to come back. In fact, I was watching this interview with this MMA fighter. He said his grandmother came up with a good phrase I want to share with you. She said, he got into some trouble and he had to work his way out. And she said, 10 miles into the woods, woods are a force for people who for whom it was in their first language. 10 miles into the woods, 10 miles out. Meaning however far you go down a particular path that perhaps isn't the best path, that's how far you have to get out. That might not take you the same amount of time to get out. You might have some techniques, but you know, if you are spending years like I did, that stopped exercising for years, it's going to take you a while to come back. And you know what? It's going to be harder. It's going to be tougher the longer you wait. And um, so I was experiencing things that I hadn't experienced when I was like just exercising regularly. One of them is I, have, I was finding it super hard. I'm like not, I don't really like the gym that much. I have to get really motivated for it. I don't like running. You know, the gym and running are really good. I like to play sports, but I couldn't find sports that I wanted to play regularly. And I couldn't find like, you know, when I would go to classes that they, they weren't that good, etc. cetera. You know, I don't know if anyone's experienced that. What I mean is I couldn't make it fun. So, it all, so I'm relating this to daily meditation, by the way. So what I mean is it became even more challenging because I had developed energetic habit uh, in, in Sanskrit, something's called, there's something called samskaras. There are impressions in your, called your subtle body, in your mind, in your emotional. They're called bodies, the coverings on your soul, your mind, emotions, are coverings on your soul. they are impressions and that shape your very mind and emotions and it's by what you do and it's the same as you can imagine like your physical body has some scars meaning you're exercising regularly it shapes a particular way it shape, shape itself according to the activities it's engaged in if you don't engage in activity it'll shape itself um, accordingly as well and so then you have to overcome those some scars and that's what makes it super difficult is that just how far and how long you've been doing or not doing particular activity, but th that your mind, your emotions, and even your physical body has been shaped. So then you have to reshape them, and that's difficult, and it might not be that pleasing in the beginning. And so then I was studying because uh, I think, according to yoga philosophy, it says this in uh, the Amrita Bindu Upanishad, which is a scripture from India. It says, for man, mind is the cause of bondage and mind is the cause of liberation. Yoga is all about the mind. And it says, if you get control of the mind, then you can get control of your life. And if you can't get control of your mind, you can't have peace. And if you can't have peace, you can't be happy. So the mind is the whole game. So I was thinking about this in terms of meditation regularly. Right? It's really the mind. Because we can all agree, how many people would agree if you do it daily, your life's better. And I think, mm -hmm. how do you say your name again? Koalani. Koalani. I think Koalani, was, was, I was really impressed about what she was saying. She does it during the day. It reminded me of a Bible verse. She should pray unceasingly. Rumi said, fish like us need the ocean around, water around us all the time. Like, it's something that we go to. I teach a lot about the scriptures, and I talk about getting seed verses from scripture that uh, it's higher divine knowledge that you can use to remind you of a present-day problem. Meaning, so there's a, if there's a problem right now, there should be something in your mind to counter it. For me, it'll be a scriptural verse, something enlightening that I maybe have heard or read somewhere else, or maybe it's called Lani days, just centering yourself and focusing your mind for a little bit always bringing you back um, and so any regular thing you're going to is going to be key in reshaping your mind and your emotions and um, I was looking at uh, this one MMA trainer he's talking about he said you should never be sore after you work out I mean there's different there's different uh, theories on that some people say work to the exhaustion 
And he said, this is why, and I really like that he was addressing it from a mental perspective. He said, first of all, if you're sore, you can't do it every day. Secondly, if you're, you push yourself to being sore every time you train, it's only a small percentage of the population for whom that's going to be pleasant. Right? Most people don't really aren't going to enjoy that feeling. And he said, quite simply, you're going to do things that you enjoy more frequently. And so he said, exercise, and I'm going to say this to meditation, he said it should switch into being actually addictive because it makes you feel good. It's ending, it should be regular. He said, especially in the beginning, he said volume over intensity, which I thought was really good. So he's going to basically with meditation, 20 minutes a day is better than trying to really go hard and you're not there yet until you build up those muscles. And then it should be, it's, it's not going to be pleasant and easy, especially in the beginning. So I tell people that. I tell people all the time, if it's hard, then do it, do it hard. There has to be some measure of discipline, and discipline is an austerity. Austerity means doing hard things now for greater gain later. Um, but I think one key to being regular, and regular is where you get the benefits, is I say this to people all the time, your intellect needs to be able to tell your emotions how to feel, and you need to be able to tell yourself based on truth what to do. I forgot this quote, I forgot who said it, but somebody said, a hero is a person who can give herself an order and have it obeyed. Right? And the Talmud said, who is a hero? The one who controls her senses, who can control her mind, who can control what she sees, hears. And so what I realized is, like, as I'm starting to exercise, what I realized is I have to position myself to be able to just exercise three times a week. Because the body's actually a thing. And it's going to shape based on what you do. So no matter what you do, really, if you do an hour of exercise three times a week, your body will shape accordingly. If you can meditate three times a week, no matter what, your mind will shape differently and get better. So the key is how do you get that? And what this trainer was saying, it's a mental hurdle. How many people would agree? It's actually a mental hurdle. And so what I was thinking about is how do you overcome the mental hurdle? And one way is your why. And it's your intelligence. You need a reason that's bigger than your excuses. Does that make sense? You need your, your reason for doing something has to be far more important than your reason for not. And that's a judgment call on yourself. It has to matter. You have to come to a point of deciding this has to happen. And what happens is this. I'll say this. Also, it might not, the thing might not happen in a single day, but if you're mentally pushing yourself to do it every day, even if you don't physically get it done, you'll, you'll eventually get it done. Has anyone ever experienced that? If you're mentally telling yourself or putting yourself in a position, telling yourself, I used to smoke, and you know what? I did buy some packs. I buy one at a time. I'd make it hard. <laughs> so if I wanted a cigarette, I had to get up, go to a store, buy one of them, and that was it. And so, and then I'd be like, this is not cool, man. Can't last. <laughs> right? Every time. <laughs> and then when I finally got a reason more, which is to get back in shape and just to feel better, my reasons finally kicked in, but also I was weakening my resolve to smoke even as I was doing it. Right? So there was forces pushing me. So I was mentally working against them and finally kicked over physically. Does that make sense? So I think you need a why, you need a reason. And this is just that with meditation or exercise with anything. You need a reason. You need your why. If you have your re and your why has to be bigger than your why not. And then what's going to have to happen too is your intelligence are going to have to tell your emotions how to feel. And you're going to have to tell yourself what to do based on that. And so I'm going to talk about, um, really briefly, the subtle bodies. And we're talking about meditation. And today I want to actually practice it. So that's where we're getting super practical. But in short, um, and I'm going to write all this down. The mind, emotions, and intellect are coverings on the soul. The soul is pure consciousness. And so they're bodies. And that's why, they, that's why they're intrinsic to one person. Right? Tell me your name one more time. Judy. Judy. Judy feels things 
that I don't feel. Now, I might feel Judy sometimes if I'm psychic or blah, 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 blah. But Judy's feelings are basically Judy's. Um, and why is that? Because it's Judy's emotional body. It's Judy's particular covering on her soul that sticks with Judy, the soul, wherever she goes, and it'll just stick between lifetimes. Why does Judy have thoughts, memories, etc., that I don't have? Because those are things that have stuck with Judy's mental body. Just like if things happen to your physical body, it stays there and shapes it. Same with your body, much the same with your intellect. But as it, these subtle bodies go higher, so it goes from the physical body to what's called the etheric body, energy body, emotional body, mental body, intellectual body. As you go higher, it gets finer, meaning it's more subtle. So the intellect, the, 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 the purpose of the intellect is to discern fact from fiction, to find out what's real and what, and then the social intellect, they usually, if, if properly applied, your intelligence should have a clear understanding of what ought to be done and what shouldn't than your emotions. How many people can understand and agree with that? Right? Typically, your emotions being of a denser quality and more closely connected to the earth plane, they're going to... Somebody says this. It's not hard to be negative. It's the norm. The general atmosphere of earth right now is we're living in something called the Kali Yuga, the age of darkness. There's more negativity than positivity. You might like to think that they're not optimistically, and I wouldn't say I'm an optimist or a pessimist. I would say I'm actually more of an optimist, but I'm a realist first. And, and uh, if you look at what's happening in the world, and especially, and the proof is in the wood, I say right away, are most people happy consistently? I think most people would experience some happiness, and most people would have pleasures. But generally, life is hard. It's a struggle for most people. And for the people in this room, at least on a physical platform, we probably got it better than the, the majority. Right? Some people are struggling hard just to eat. And that's not, that, and on top of that, they have the emotional stuff. All of us, most of our problems are emotional. Right? Of course, there's physical, and of course, there's pains, etc. But most of our problems are going to be mental and emotional. Right? If you made it here to Bali, if you're on vacation, you're doing a yoga course, whatever you're doing. Um, and so the emotions are going to very easily sink into a negative mind state and a self-destructive mind state. The mind will constantly process this and, and remind you of what it feels and, and what it wants. The intellect has to sort it all out and say, no matter what's happening emotionally, this is what needs to be done. Just like a parent will tell a child, hey, emotions, you want to feel better? Do this, even if you don't feel like doing it. And that's going to be the crux of the issue. Can you do what needs to be done when you don't feel like doing it? What's your, what would be a good tip for daily meditation and good motivation, or is it personal to each person? Right. So this is what I would say. A good tool. Right. No. No. In terms of making sure you get it done. Yeah. I've been talking about this for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> Everything I just said. The purpose. You say the purpose. Right. You need a why. You need a why you're going to meditate, and you need to meditate on that why. This is so. This is this is too big for me not to do it. First thing. Secondly, you need to intellectually understand the benefit that you're going to get, and then tell your emotions. I know you feel this way, which is I don't want to do it, but you'll feel better if you do. And even if you don't feel better in the first week or two, sooner or later you will. So come on, let's go. <laughs> And, and your intellect needs to take your emotions hands and sit down in a quiet place for as long as you can. And then your intellect needs to know what to expect. Don't be unrealistic. Hey, you might not get blissed out. You might not see Jesus your first session. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're going to have to stay at it. <laughs> right? No matter, you, no matter how you feel. And then the emotions begin to adapt. Just like a parent would train a child. So that's the first thing. Why? Your intellect needs to step in. 
and do it. And then the third thing I say, what, what we, uh, Koalani? 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 One minute, Koalani. And the third thing is I say this a lot. I, I think I'm going to repeat this. Um, I always tell people, how do you love yourself? Secret to loving yourself. Now you know. So everyone, because this is a big question. Do the hard thing that you need done. Things you want other people to do for you. Things you wish the universe would just let happen. But the universe is not. <laughs> you do it. Even if it's hard. That's love. And how about this? When you feel loved by someone else, don't you feel very loved when somebody does something hard and painful just for you? Right? When someone suffers for you, when someone sacrifices for you, when someone suffers for you, you feel loved. When someone thinks of you, and not just thinks of you, acts for you. Especially if you didn't even ask him or her to do it. That's feeling loved. Do this for yourself. So you need a why. Your intellect needs to tell your emotions what to do, what to feel. And then you need to love yourself enough to do it. And you know, the main really thing, the key to it really, is to do it no matter how you feel. And even if you don't do a lot of it, do it no matter how you feel. And, and even if you just do a little bit, because you know it's best. <coughs> Go on. Oh, you're talking about having um, a why. So that has helped me to do my, my daily meditation. As I mentioned earlier, I have anxiety. So now my new mantra is meditation is my new medication. So whenever I thought I would take like an anxiety pill or something like that, I go straight to meditation so I don't have to do anything. Oh, that's awesome. And you know what? Also, I think it's perfect because that's exactly what it is. Medicine. And I think just meditation is medicine. We know exercise is medicine. And it's, right now, I think we kind of program it's easier to even do physical things than it is to do mental things. But exercise is medicine. And you need you know the medicine that you need. Exercise is medicine. Good company is medicine. Healthy laughter is medicine. I'm going to go further. Studying scripture because it's higher understanding. Listening to a, a really positive, enlightening podcast that really hits the button where you, that's medicine. What I mean is hearing truth. Truth is medicine. Discipline is medicine. Right? And so the main thing to remember is you'll feel better. And luckily I have guides. I'm a channel, so I talk to divine beings. And sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. You know what, they'll come in and just say, they say, sweetheart, <laughs> you'll feel better. And they'll just say, just like that. They're like, I know it's hard, you'll feel better. And, uh, and then you do it. And you know what happens is they're right. And when you're feeling really down, and this is the other thing he was talking about, flow state. He said, it's not that we're ignoring the emotions, we're just not obeying them, but you will honor them. But he said, so when you're doing these things, he said, just like with exercise, he said, in his opinion, stop before you get too sore. He said, because, in fact, there's this flow state chart, I mean, flow state like chart, it's super simple. Um, that's him right. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure who came up with it. I saw it online. I wish I had it on my phone. Um, but basically he was saying, they were like saying, uh, if there's too much effort and not enough skill, then you're not going to flow. Meaning, um, where you get, the flow state is a happy state, basically. And it's a state in which you want to keep doing something. Uh, oh, that's what he said. He says too much effort, not enough skill. Then you, then there's boredom or, or, or no, like, what was it? Basically pain, unhappiness. I forgot what you, the term he used. But it's unpleasant. Pain, basically. Too much effort, not enough skill. Or, uh, or if there's a lot, or if you have a lot of skill with not enough effort, 
I'm, t I'm botching this. You have to actually look at it. I can't remember from the game. But basically, another one is it's either pain or boredom. So what he was saying was, uh, and you can look it up. I'm getting something wrong here. But basically, what he was saying was, say you're skilled at something, right? Then your effort needs to increase for, to you to be at a high level of flow state. Um, say something super hard or with low skill, then uh, you're not going to be having fun because it's just going to be difficult. And so you need to find out where you balance between your skills are being employed or at least developed and you're putting in the right amount of effort that you feel like you want to continue. Does that make sense? So the reason I'm just bringing that up is that's how it should be in your meditation. And look at look online for a better chart. It's, I got one or two things wrong, but I think everyone gets the gist, right? Meaning, don't burn yourself out and don't go too light on yourself that you just don't get anything done. Try to make it enjoyable. That's another thing I've done. So I would say, find your why. Make sure your intellect is dominant over your emotions. And, and being dominant doesn't mean it's domineering. Meaning the emotions also just need free expression. And the intellect should know when the emotions need that free expression. Does that make sense? And then the intellect should know we're now, okay, you've expressed yourself, we have business to attend to. So why intellect over emotions? Love yourself enough to do it even if it's hard. And then, don't go beyond the point where it's too painful. I mean, don't go into the place where it's too painful and try to make it as enjoyable as possible. And um, one way to make it as enjoyable as possible is to keep it to 20 minutes, right, in the beginning until you want to do more. Does that make sense? So that you're not hating yourself, pushing yourself too much. Okay. So that's motivation to meditate. I think the trap is when, you, when, you, when everything's fine, when like, your eating's fine, your gym is fine, your work, your life is fine. The urge to meditate drops a little bit because everything's perfect. And, and, and at least that's how I feel. It's like everything's fantastic every day. Gym, food, no drinking, none of things fine. Why meditate? That's a, uh, that's a trap. I, I, I get or what you're doing is already in a flow state, working out, or, yeah. right? And that is your meditation. Yeah, but I still think that they need. Right, so he said how to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know what I would yeah. say? Something. Uh, it's, it's, it's two things. One, let me address what he said. I think what he said to some degree is actually accurate. This is a common saying in all spiritual circles, including yogic circles. It says, so yoga means you with God. It says no one comes to God but you suffer. Like if no one does something difficult, usually, until the pain is so great they have to. Right? Because we're pleasure seeking by nature. Right? Um, and so nobody wants to suffer if they don't have to. <laughs> right? And so usually what motivates people to really change is huh? You're already suffering. Right. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Everyone wants some relief, or they'll do it to do something to change the situation when their suffering gets unbearable. And human beings have amazing capacity to endure what I would call uh, low burn suffering. Like you know what I mean, low scale suffering. In fact, if you look at the majority of human beings, the majority of human beings flamed out in middle age. And what they do is they accept what, uh, I think it was, maybe it was Emerson who described it this way, or maybe it was Thoreau, I forgot, maybe it was somebody else, it said, a life of quiet desperation, right, where they've accepted, I'm not going to, you know, when I was a kid, everybody has these grand thoughts of what you're going to do, and then life hits them, they're 50, and they're not there, and they accept it. Or this is the partner I wanted when I was however old. And then they got the partner they got, and they're too afraid to leave them because they don't want to be alone. They don't even really like them. Right? And so they just beak it out. Right? Or they're single and they would like to be in a relationship, 
But, and I'll say this, this is be hard on people, I, I get to hear this a thousand all the time, they can't overcome the things in their own mind and habits that prevent them from being able to be in a relationship. Right. And I get people all the time coming and they want me to tell them, like they, they're like, they can't be in a relationship and they want me to tell them it's not your fault. I'm like, you know what, if you're 40, um, you got a hand in it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, of course there's going to be some time, but we can always improve. You can always, I mean, you don't have to be 40 for that. You can be 20. But what I mean is, um, it's too hard to look at themselves. So they have this slow burn unhappiness of loneliness. So they have this slow burn unhappiness of unhappiness with my partner. Or whatever it is. They, they want to get in shape. It's too hard. They just kind of give up, right? They, they gave up on that career goal. They gave up on et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, they, and they pretend. They either pretend like they're happier than they are, or they just live in denial. Like when the truth comes up, they just run away from it. They spend their lives running away from their own truth, the truth of their own selves. Um, and so we advocate a different course. Like being a hero is doing something different. Right? That's the beginning. So because that's more of the norm, you can be a hero, but actually yoga will show the way. So this is the beginning. So let's talk about how meditation can actually be framed it that way. Can help you be a hero. Um, so let's talk about, uh, first of all, the mind. Because meditation has to do with the mind. So, according to your philosophy, you're a soul. The soul is pure consciousness. So we should be super clear about this. What we are is awareness and energy. Okay? You're not your body. You're not your mind. And that is the real key to getting control of it. To create some separation between yourself and your mind and emotions. Um, it's not that you shouldn't fully feel it, but you should feel it. Um, but you want to be able to gain control of it. The way you gain control of it is you realize that it's not you. Does that make sense? I think this is where we, we all of us, most of us at least, are having major difficulties in our lives um, because our mind is going nuts, our emotions are going nuts, and we totally identify with it. We can't get out of that identification. So the first step is to step back and to realize that this thing that you're caught up in, these things you're so fired up about, and I have to do this daily too, it's not even you. You think it's you. You're pure consciousness. You can observe it. Right? The fact that you can observe your thoughts tells you that there's an observer. Correct? The truth is you're that observer. That awareness is what you are, not your thoughts. You can observe your feelings. You're that thing observing, not the feelings. But what are the feelings? They're coverings. So the soul comes into the world. As it comes into the various planes of existence, yoga philosophy says that there are multiple planes of existence, it gains coverings that allow it to function at that plane. So we'll, we'll, there's higher planes in this, but we'll talk about what's called the causal plane. Is the plane of super consciousness. Direct perception of truth. So, you have a covering on your pure consciousness called your causal body. And your soul, a part of you, is existing in that causal body in a place called the causal plane. Your soul is connected, or one, throughout these different planes, and primarily our consciousness is here on the physical plane. Um, there's parts of us, and these are the parts that are called your higher self. 
And so when you get a direct perception of truth, they call it an epiphany, a download, a moment of clarity. Anyone ever heard, had them? Where, and not just that, it's undeniably true. There's no doubt. That's usually co information coming from your causal body, from the causal plane all the way down to your consciousness and the physical. You know that you have what's called the astral plane, and that's divided into the intellectual, mental, and emotional. So your intellect, its job is what's called discrimination. You can tell me what the term discrimination actually means. Discern. Discern, exactly. And not just to discern. What does discern mean, Kualani? What does discern mean? Hold on, wait, wait. To separate truth from your Right. The intellect is meant to analyze correctly. And discrimination means to separate this from that. That's basically what discrimination means. So your intellect is supposed to discern what is beneficial and what is not beneficial, to see them both clear, exactly. Does that make sense? What is the truth and what is not the truth? So that's the job of the intellect, and that's what your intellectual body does. That's what this particular covering on your body does. The mental body, which is the mind, and all of these are largely the mind, actually, and it has, it has subconscious and conscious elements. What it does is it stores and recycles impressions about the soul's experiences. So this kind of big, what does that mean? So your mind is a machine. Like everyone recognize your body is a machine? So your mind is a machine and what it does is your soul, your pure consciousness, is having all types of experiences. Right? Actually I should say, ooh I forgot. It's a super important body that I didn't write. The ego. The ego is what's called the false self. It is, creates the idea of an individual I. For example, Judy. In fact, Judy and I are the same being. Everyone aware of that? But due to our egos, I'm constantly thinking I'm Satyatma. And Judy's constantly thinking she's Judy. And we're processing the world information in that way. So the reason this is actually a positive thing is that it allows for a, a type of gain. If we were all living in our oneness, then uh, we couldn't play the game of interrelating in the same way. Right? Does that make sense? Because we're all just one. But now we have the illusion that we're different people. Now we can have different types of relationships. Does that make sense? So it's all a great cosmic gain, and that's what these bodies are for. The problem is we get caught in the illusion of the gain, and there's unpleasant things that come with it as well. So the ego is the first covering that creates the very idea that you're separate from everyone else. And what happens is the ego then has its own individual desires. Your body, if you've noticed, your physical body has its own desires. Anyone ever notice that? I'll tell you how I noticed this. Anyone ever been like super hungry and like your body's looking for food and you're not even consciously fully with it? You kind of want to do something else, but your body's like food, food, food. 
when you sit down, anyone ever so long you sit down and it's like you're in your fourth bite before you realize that you're fully eating, right? That's your body, right? Because it has self-preservation mechanisms. All the bodies have self-preservation mechanisms, including the ego. So what happens is the soul having these bodies journeys from place to place, lifetime to lifetime, different culture, even different planets it could be, but definitely different cultures, uh, different times, can be different, different bodies for sure. It has experiences. The ego has judgments about those experiences. Meaning it's good and bad. I like that one. I didn't like this one. This one hurt. That one felt good. The mind is the body that acts as the recorder and it stores that information and it recycles it over and over again in the consciousness. So your mind is a machine that simply turns it over, over and over and over and over, like incessantly. It doesn't give you a break. It turns over the ego's judgments about its experiences and it ingrains it into the consciousness. Such and such screwed me over. I'm mad about it. And it will repeat that over and over and over again. Until the mind, until the soul is just trapped in that. You can't see out of it. Right? It's the same with the emotions. What are the emotions? They're simply feelings. But, they, but it does the same thing because the mind and emotions are connected. So then there's the etheric body. The etheric body is what you might call just the energy body. It's not a full plane of existence on its own. It's a buffer zone between the physical and the astral, meaning it's a buffer zone between the physical and the mental, emotional, and intellectual. The third body is where your chakras exist, and it is uh, it produces your aura. And so the chakras are the link between the mind, emotions, mental, the non-physical, and the physical. So, what is meditation meant to do? It's meant to give the soul control over this machine. Because guess what? If you can, and it's not even, once you control it, then you neutralize it. Once you can neutralize the incessant activity of the mind, intellect, and emotions, once they are stilled, what happens to the consciousness that's here? There's a direct connection here. Did that make sense? Anyone follow that? The questions are that. That's yes. I thought that um, the well, the body is like an entity within itself. You call it a machine. I kind of disagree, but I'm coming from a science background. So it's, so it's, it's more. I'm also saying this. I'm coming from a science background. Okay, but I don't see the body as a machine. Okay. So the, um, there's there's a you you have the the soul and the body. So the body is the entity within itself that can tell the mind and kind of control the mind. I want this, 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 and this. This hurts. That hurts. So it was my impression that it's the mind that has to sometimes take control over the body because a lot of physical pain that you experience, it can be mental or it could be physical. So you have to determine which one it is you're dealing with. And you can't look at it as just one thing that's going on between the mind and the body. Of course, so we, we agree on that. Okay. But I think what I think I don't think we're disagreeing. I think um, when you say an entity, define an entity. Well, um, an organism that can pretty much function. It can function, but I wouldn't call it an organism. An organism means a living thing. Correct. Right, and the body is a living thing. The skin is a living organism. I'm gonna, this is why I'm going to disagree. You know why? How is it that it can become a non-living thing? You can agree that the body can become a non-living thing, right? Kill it. Then what happens? So how is it that it transfers from a living thing to a non-living thing? What's the difference? 
Hello, wait, wait, wait. No, no. <laughs> uh, I, want, I want to hear it. What's the difference? Between a living organism and a No, a living body and a dead body. The heart stops speaking. Exactly. Why? If, so we know that the bodily functions start with the heart start beating. So the question is going to be what's making the heart beat? Well, yeah, all this stuff up here in the in the brain and and um, what stuff? hormone specific. hormones okay. and what's the nervous the hormones, system? The hormones are flowing. The nervous system. Flowing. The nervous system. Yeah. So, what's making the nervous system active? I'm agreeing with the brain. What's making the, so you're saying the brain is making the heart beat? What's making the brain active? Energy. Would you agree, Kolani? What? Energy? She said energy's making the brain act. Yeah. Yeah, the energy energy is the, the divine, the sort, energy. divine energy. Energy is the source of everything. Right. So you, are we in agreement that it's energy making the heart beat and the brain function? Right. Okay, I see where you're going with this, but okay. Um, okay, so, so therefore so energy it takes energy for a machine to run. So therefore the body has to be a machine. Is that where's the energy coming from? The sun. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Not necessarily the sun could be shining, or it could be. No, the sun be shining, and your body could still be dead. <laughs> Our soul. Well, that's what I would say. But if someone has a different answer, I'll hear it. But this is what happens when we're physically it. Um, a really good analogy because I'm a nerd that I heard uh, was think about a computer system. You have the hardware and the computer yeah, system. Yeah, I know computers too. Right. You've got the CPU so the, and you've right, got the RAM and all that. It's um, pretty, pretty much worthless unless you have software. Right, so my point is this, and this is what physical... Here's the thing about it. If you actually really study what the physical sciences are getting at, their more advanced studies are coming to the conclusions of what the Vedas and yoga philosophy came to. Like, like what is it, quantum physics? Yeah, quantum physics. Or they're literally, I said this, I said to these people years ago, I was like, great, they're catching up, they're going to catch up and they're going to merge. Because truth is true. So if they discover the truth, they're going to discover that what the yogis have been talking about for 8,000 years is the truth. Because it's the truth, it doesn't change. So, this is the question I have to all the physical scientists. Everyone agrees it's, it's the heart, really, that's making it all go. Boom. And what, how's the heart functioning? Electrical force. None of them can identify the electrical force. This is what is called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means I hold a belief. And I'm going to stick to it no matter what the evidence shows. I'm going to reject everything else. If you can't answer where the electrical force is, don't reject our evidence for it because we discovered it a long time ago. It is the soul. The soul itself is energy. The presence of the soul, and I can tell you how it works energetically. The presence of the soul in the body produces the electrical spark which activates the machine. And then from once the machine is activated, boom. Once that energy leaves, you unplug, the machine can no longer function because it doesn't have energy to run on. How this works, quite frankly, is this. The chakras in the etheric plane conduct energy, which is non-physical, into the physical. How they do so is a long story. Things called nerve plexuses. And where the metaphysical chakras are in the Eastern system, if you actually look along your spine, those are nerve plexuses, being concentrations of nerves. Some of those nerves, when you chase them to the end of them, are very fine, even microscopic. What chakras do is they capture non-physical energy, which we all feel. Anybody feel vibes? Right? Your mind. Where is it? We know it's not just the brain. Where is it? How about the hormones and the nerves, like nerve transmitters in between the... Oh yeah, I'll say, I'll say that right now. So, alright, what I was saying was the mind, this is what's happening. So, you, and what I mean is people who 
like what gets me is how there hasn't been a full bridge of these things yet. But this mystical knowledge has existed for thousands of years. People are going on it right now. So basically, your consciousness, meaning your pure energy, is existing beyond the physical. And these mental, emotional, intellectual planes. They have their own activities going on. Because you're physically connected with that, when there is a thought or an emotion, or when there's an outside source of non-physical energy, it hits the aura, which is an energy field. It activates the aura. It then, based on what vibration it is, is channeled into a particular chakra, which handles that particular vibration. For example, if it's the vibration of love or connectedness. It hits the ore. The ore recognizes it, channels it to the heart chakra. The heart chakra spins. Those very fine nerves, the chakras translates this non-physical energy, this emotional energy of, of feeling connected to an electrical impulse. And that's what the chakras are. They're translators of energy. It, it hits these fine nerves. The nervous system is stimulated. The nervous system stimulates the endocrine system, which releases hormones, one of them oxytocin. Yeah. And then you feel connected to this person. And that's how non-physical events become physical. And that's how it works. And that's how the soul, because the soul is the energy source of all the bodies, innervates all the bodies, including the physical one. Without the presence of the soul, none of the bodies work. So that's why I say I'm defining an entity as something that has life. Life is, comes from spirit. Spirit is life. This matter, it's spirit in a different way. Your science gets even deeper. That's because everything is one. Everything is spirit. This is spirit. This is pure consciousness. Through between this spirit and us, is that we have what's called Chaitanya or Chaitanya, which means living force. And that's what produces energy, the Chaitanya of the soul. So yogis have already thought of all of this. And so that's actually how it works. And you know what? That makes perfect sense. If you have all these great scientific understandings, and that's just you know what I'm saying, physical scientists in general, and then they arrive at a complete dead end, <laughs> right? Like, okay, we, they, they'll say we don't know what consciousness is. We're just studying. The yogis approach it from the other side. However, because it's non physical, you need non physical tools to study it. All right, so that's my thing. I, I studied all the science, and now I'm in meditation and I'm having these experiences. So I'm trying to go past the physical and understand what's going on when I'm in meditation and I come out and then people say, oh, you're glowing because something happened to me in meditation. What's the deal? And how can I get to higher planes? Right, so you're experiencing the right. results of it. So I appreciate that you're willing to go to higher levels of knowledge and experience. So what we're saying is these non-physical experiences just like the physical world, you need physical tools to really be able to examine it in depth. You need to develop your non-physical tools, which are your pure consciousness and your mind, intellect, emotions, and causal body. Thich Nhat Hanh said, our bodies are the tools with which we experiment with reality. Our consciousness itself is the tools that we use to learn about these higher realms of consciousness. And that's what we do in meditation. So good. The question about soul, that was actually the, the thing that I've been thinking lately. And it was the latest question so far in my discovery of this life, basically. But why don't humans just call soul the energy? Like, what? Because soul comes across as something that is separated, like not one thing, you know? When we say energy, we think that it's everywhere, we call it God, some people, you know, like it's everywhere and it's connected and we are just separated by the ego. But then when we say soul, it means that it's like each of us has 
the entity of a soul, right? Yeah. So it is, uh, we don't, we call soul energy, and we're not, I think that's a mental thing if you disconnect it from everything else. The soul, souls are one, and it's called the Padamatma, the supreme soul, the oneness. So again, yoga philosophy's covered this, Brahma. Mm -hmm. Brahma means spirit, it's all of existence, and it's impersonal spirit. Atma means soul. The Atman is both Brahman and individualized. And so there's what's called the Paramatma, the Supreme Soul, that's the oneness. The Jivatma, which is an individual soul. Me, Judy, Sada, Kamala, etc. Okay. Can it be said like if the soul is like an individual spark of the energy? Yeah, well, I mean, you didn't have to say spark, you say individual part of it. Uh, yeah, for sure. That, that's accurate. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is make sure you don't get tripped up by semantics. Mm -hmm. Semantics just means word choice. Like like what do you mean? Again, that's that's like blinders. If you're if people use different words to describe something, go beyond the words and know what the thing is that yeah, they yeah. describe. Like, yeah. yeah. So don't be like so some people get turned off. You say the word God, or you say so, etc., etc. Anyway, so cool. So that, so now we know what we're trying to do in meditation. Are we getting a better idea of what meditation is, what we're trying to do? The pure consciousness is grabbing hold of the subtle bodies. So I want to read really quick. And we won't have time to meditate today, but um, you can practice. Um, and uh, we do a meditation tomorrow. I'll tell you about it later if you want. But this is called, uh, I'm going to read something called the Raja Yoga Sutras. Um, and it's in a, this is, anybody, actually, some people always ask, can I recommend a book? And I don't have a lot of books to recommend. If you want a summary of yoga philosophy, this is the best one I've ever come across and I've been studying for 25 years. Having said that, he is part of my little lineage. I like, I started studying with one of his disciples, <laughs> but I haven't seen a better summary of it. He's, he's the founder of the Shiva Nanda organization. His name is Swami Vishnu. There's a book called uh, Meditation and Mantras. It summarizes yoga philosophy brilliantly. What's his name again? Swami Vishnu Deva Nanda. Uh -huh. Can I read all this? Sangha means eight limbs. Ast means eight. Anga means limbs. So the eight limbs of this path are yamas. Niyamas, these are the moral codes. It's actually on our website. We actually did a series called The Foundation of Yoga. We covered all the yamas and niyamas. The reason the foundation of yoga is because you start with this, the spiritual moral codes of yoga. Um, and we did lectures in this very class. It's online if you ever want to see it. Um, next one is asanas. Then pranayama. Asanas are the physical exercises that we do. Uh, pranayam means to control prana. Who knows what prana is? Anyone? No. <laughs> but almost. Life energy, which is existing everywhere, is accessed through the breath. So pranayama are breathing techniques that, to control prana. Right, like yama actually comes from the same Sanskrit word as yoga. Yoga means union. It actually means um, the soul with the supreme. That's the term, that's what yoga means. It comes from the Sanskrit word huge. So that's the definition of yoga. And it goes further, and I'm actually going to show it to you through absolutely stilling the mind. That is the actual scriptural definition of yoga, and we'll see why that's so powerful. So yoga does not mean union of mind, body, and spirit. You bring the mind, you mean the mind and body under the control to unite your spirit with the Supreme Spirit. It's a very large misconception that's taught out here. That's what he refers to, and this is attained by one way, stilling the mind. So then, these are so these are the steps. Ooh, yoga is very scientific. 
After pranayama, you go to what's called pratyahara. Then dharana. Dhyan. And then samadhi. So these are all preparations. First, yamas and niyamas. You act spiritually and morally, or else you can't access the fine energies of divinity. And that's and there's five of those and five of those, and there's, there's even more in other systems. Once you have a moral base, so let's be clear about this. In traditional yoga practice, you don't practice asanas until you are immersed and committed to spiritual and moral conduct. Can we follow that? So then once you've made that commitment, once you're in it, then you practice asanas. The purpose of asanas, again, given in the scripture, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, is to make the body limber and free of disease. This is all preparation for the highest stages, and it actually says it in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. But he starts off, he says, Yogi Swaparam, is giving out this knowledge of Hatha Yoga, which includes asanas, only for the attainment of the most excellent Raja Yoga. So he says, the only reason I'm even teaching Hatha Yoga, which is, the basis of Hatha Yoga is asanas, pranayama, there's a few more other things in it. The reason I'm teaching you asanas and pranayama is just so that you can advance to the higher stages of Raja Yoga. Why? Because asanas make the body limber, free of disease. The energies of the bodies can flow in such a way as they don't disturb the mind. Because we're going to read right now, the whole goal is to bring the mind under control. Pranayama brings the energies further under control so the mind is stilled. So they won't get that. It will never do, after you do a, I don't know what's necessarily breath work, because breath work can be quite agitated, <laughs> right? But actually real pranayama, where you actually control it, you control it, then everyone did that, and you, have you seen how your mind stills automatically? Or a really good asana class, you know, with a really good teacher who's also able to admit maybe some spiritual vibration. Even if it's a good exercise class, you feel a little bit better. But there's some spiritual vibration there. Have you noticed how calm you are? Right? And energized. You're simultaneously energized and calm. So that the body and the mind are automatically in a calmer and more energized state. Then, that's when you start rolling into meditation practice. That's when you intend to pratyahara. Pratyahara means withdrawal. It means to withdraw your consciousness from both external and internal phenomena. After you practice withdrawal, you practice dharana, which is focus or concentration. Then you're placing your concentration where you want it. And you're keeping it there. Then, once it's there, that's when you enter to dhyana. Dhyan is meditation. So, this is the key to meditation. So now we began the class talking about why meditate, how to overcome the mental hurdles to edit meditation, what you're trying to do in meditation, grab control of subtle bodies, and then we're saying, now we're getting into the details of the practice. Meditation is defined, can I have that book back? In the Raja Yoga Sutras, and he has that, the whole Raja Yoga Sutras in the back. Meditation is defined as an unbroken flow of consciousness in one direction. That's the definition of meditation. So meditation, you're not meditating until your focus is in one place and it's not interrupted by a thought or feeling. How many of you have been there? Nice. How long are you able to stay there? The longest I've ever stayed was like five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. That's super impressive. If you can stay in meditation. Meaning you didn't have any thought or any feeling. That's beautiful. Exactly. And, um, and how did you feel? Um, I felt great. I really am 
I felt energized and at one point during that period of time that I was nothing was going on, tears was just coming down my face. Let me tell you why. The mind was still. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, once the mind is stilled, the self within is already reached. That means Rumi said this. He goes, My arrow of love has arrived at the target. I am in the house of mercy, and my heart is ablaze with prayer. That's what happens when the mind is still. He says you've already reached your target. Meaning, you know what's happened? Is the barriers between you and your true self have fallen because that's why I wrote all that stuff down because the barrier is your mind. And you don't need it. Your higher consciousness can do everything. Now, of course, because we connect with the physical plane, the mind is closer in energy. So once we have the higher conscience control of the mind, then we use the mind like a tool. A yogi can make the mind do what he wants. Say, say okay, mind, calculate this. Okay, mind, draw up this memory. But the mind is just not going to be doing it on its own. Like some uncontrolled beast like all of our minds. Right? The mind is constantly throwing, throwing stuff at you, reminding you of stuff. A yogi says... I don't need to hear that right now. Be quiet. Right? And so, but this is how you get good at meditation. This is the key to it. This is how you practice it. You can't jump to this unbroken state. What you can jump to, what you practice, is... Okay, no worries. What you practice is withdrawing your mind from where you don't need it and focusing it where you do. That's the practice which leads to it. You have to be able to take your mind off of a negative thought. You have to be able to take your mind, your, your consciousness, your soul. This is getting in contact with your soul. Take your soul your consciousness away from a negative feeling. And to place it on a positive one or to place it where you are. It would never have like some real hard stuff going on, but there was something you needed to do right then and there. And you needed to be like, okay, I need to focus. Mm-hmm. And you were able to get it done because you needed to. And when you, when you finished that, all that stuff came back, right? This is life. And so you want to be skillful enough to do this as a regular thing and the way you do it is practice it in your real life. Amma, the hugging saint said, we must learn the art of replacing the negative thought with a positive one. You know how you get good at that? Skill. Will Smith said something. And I'm not a super fan of Will Smith. But he said, talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours of banging on your craft. He said, hours and hours and hours of withdrawing your mind from unhelpful places and hours and hours of focusing it on healthy places. This is why we don't give our minds a chance. We're always listening to positive things. I'm always going to be listening to a lecture or a kirtan or something uplifting. Because I'm not, I'm going to focus at someplace positive. I'm not going to give it a chance to drag me away. As soon as I find my mind going to a negative place, sometimes actually it needs expression. Right? So, so because it, it's like a horse. They talked about it. They said the five senses are like five horses driving a chariot. The reins are like the mind. The soul is like the charioteer and the body is like a chariot. If you pull the reins too tightly all the time, what will horses do? They're going to rebel. They're just going to go wild. You won't be able to control them because they need some leeway to actually carry you. But if you don't hold the reins? They're going to take you wherever they want to take you. And they're going to, it's probably not even going to be a clean place, especially because it's five of them. Your senses will drag you everywhere if you don't pull them in. But if you always, when you leave today, how about now? Watch your mind remove it from something negative and place it on a positive. If you have a negative thought that's plaguing you, 
consciously think of the opposite over and over and over again. You keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, then it'll settle down. And then you do that more in meditation. Once you reach this, once you have spent enough time where your focus has gotten so good, your ability to withdraw your mind has gotten so good, that no thought or feeling interrupts, then you enter into samadhi. Samadhi means sameness of consciousness, oneness with source. God, merging, yoga. Once the mind is stopped long enough, as you were experiencing, Golani, you're experiencing merger. That's what you're feeling, what you describe as bliss, right? You merge long enough. You enter into that state, and then there's stages of samadhi. That's what it talks about. So I want to end class by just reading the first few chat, first few lines, in fact, of the Yoga Sutras. And then I can encourage you to continue reading on your own. If you like, afterwards, uh, you can get this as a free PDF download on my website also. It says, uh, first, it says, it starts off, famous verses. Now yoga is explained. In its next famous verse, yoga sthita ruti neroraha. You take a yoga course, usually they'll have you remember that. Yoga is bringing to an end the whirlpools of activity in the mind. So that's verse number one, number two. First verse, now yoga, atta yoga nusasanam. Now yoga is explained. Yoga chitariti naroda. Yoga is bringing to an end the whirlpools of activity in the mind. And it keeps going. It says, when that happens, the perceiver rests in her own true nature. Koalani, that's what you were experiencing. It's right here. When the mind is not concentrated, the perceiver identifies with all of the modifications of the mind in all the different whirlpools of activity. When the mind is not focused, then you identify with all of that gibberish in your mind. And then he goes on, he explains the great science. There are five types of thought waves, etc., etc., etc. He gets into the science of it. So yoga is a great science. And the science is how to unite your soul with God through bringing to cessation the world whose of activity in the world. So we'd encourage you to practice. Krishna says even a little advancement on this path can protect you from the greatest type of fear. And whatever you gain, you never lose it. It's always there for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, should we end class with three ohms? Yes. So let's thank you for bringing us together for this sad song. Everyone take, we're going to do three deep breaths and then three ohms. Everyone breathe in. Exhale. And breathe in. <laughs>